Hi everyone, in this video lecture we are going to be talking about patterns of inheritance that are a little bit more um, complex than what we saw with Mendel and his pea plants. Um, so hopefully you recall that when Mendel was looking at these pea plants he was studying some different traits, but each of these traits was determined by one gene and that gene had two alleles. So for example, if we're thinking about flower color, there was the purple color allele with a capital P, a white color allele with a little p, um, and the one of the one of the alleles was completely dominant over the other. So if a plant was heterozygous and had one purple allele and one white allele, it would end up being completely purple. But as it turns out, uh, a lot of traits don't follow rules that are quite this simple. So we might have uh, more than one gene for a given trait. We might have more than two alleles for a given gene. Um, and the pattern of uh, dominant and recessive traits, um, that relationship might not be quite so simple where one trait is completely dominant. So in the next uh, slides, we're going to be looking at some uh, ex exceptions to Mendelian genetics or some, some examples of non-Mendelian genetics. And the first one that we're going to talk about is um, different patterns for dominance. So instead of one trait being completely dominant over the other, we also have uh, this pattern where we see incomplete dominance. And in incomplete dominance, a heterozygous um, individual is going to express an intermediate phenotype that's sort of in between the homozygous recessive and the homozygous dominant phenotype. So sort of a blend of the two uh, extreme phenotypes, you could say. So an example of this would be if you have uh, curly hair being sort of dominant over straight, where curly is capital C, capital C, and straight is lowercase c, lowercase c, a heterozygous person with uh, one big C and one little c might show a, a wavy kind of hair in between curly and straight. And another example in flower color, uh, if you have a red, a red, um, red flower and a white flower, if you um, cross them together and get a heterozygous flower, instead of the red being completely dominant over the white, you'd get a sort of mixing of the two colors and you'd end up with a pink flower. So incomplete dominance, you get a blended phenotype. And the other uh, way that dominance can work is called co-dominance. And this is when a, a person or an individual who is heterozygous is going to express both of the alleles or show both phenotypes simultaneously. So in cattle, uh, you can get red um, hair color or coat color and white coat color. And if the trait is co-dominant, co uh, you'll get what's called a roan coat color. So you'll get this sort of splotchy, some of the hairs will be white and some of the hairs will be red. So they're expressing both the white and the red at the same time. Another example of this can be seen in chickens. Uh, you can cross a white chicken with a black chicken and a heterozygous uh, chicken with the black allele and the white allele will show feathers that are both black and white at the same time. Okay, so this is the last slide and it's just to um, emphasize the difference between incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Um, so if, if we're thinking about flower color and we have red flowers and white flowers, if red is completely dominant over white, like what we were talking about with Mendel, then a heterozygous flower is just going to be red. But we also could get situations where we see a pink flower or a splotchy red and white flower. And the pink flower is a blend between the two phenotypes. It's sort of in between the two. So that's going to be incompletely dominant. And the splotchy flower um, that shows both red and white simultaneously, um, since it's showing both of the alleles or both phenotypes, that's going to be um, co-dominance. One way that I... Um, tend to remember the difference between incomplete and codominance is that incomplete starts with an I and the incomplete dominance pattern is where you get something that's in between the two phenotypes of the um, of the two parents. So incomplete dominance is in between, it's a blended phenotype, and codominance, um, the second letter is an O and that reminds me of like 
spots or splotchiness. So anytime you're seeing splotchy patterns where you're seeing both phenotypes present at the same time, that's going to be codominance. Okay, so just a couple notes about dominance and dominant traits before we move on to some other extensions to Mendelian inheritance. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that just because an allele is dominant does not mean that it's better. And it also, and this is maybe not super intuitive, it also doesn't mean that it's particularly common. You can have uh, recessive traits that are more common in a population than dominant traits. An example of this is um, polydactyly, where you have more than five fingers on your hands or more than five toes on your feet. Um, and that is actually a dominant trait. So having six fingers is dominant over having just five, but it's still rare. So only about one in 500 um, babies are born with polydactyly. Okay, so previously we were talking about um, traits where there were only two alleles that we only had two options for alleles. So either you have a purple allele or you have a white allele for flower color. Or if you're a chicken, you have either a black feather color or white feather color. But for some traits, there are more than two alleles um, that you can have as an option. So this is showing um, some rabbits, and you can see that there are four different alleles here um, that could lead to brown fur, um, black fur that's tipped with white, white fur with um, black sort of extremities, or white fur. Um, so we can have more than one option or more than two options for any allele. Another example is with these clovers. I think there are um, seven different alleles that are, are possible for clover um, coloration patterns. And obviously, the more alleles that you have, the more combinations you can put those alleles in. So you'll get more possible phenotypes. But one thing to keep in mind is that uh, regardless of how many allele possibilities there are in a population of individuals, one person is only going to carry two alleles at a time. And that's because if we think about our homologous pairs, you're going to have one allele on the paternal chromosome and one allele on the maternal chromosome. So one person is going to have two alleles, but there might be more than those two in the population as a whole but each person can only carry two. Okay, another situation that we can have is called polygenic inheritance. And this is when one trait is determined by the cumulative effect of a lot of different genes. So each gene or each allele combination is gonna contribute a little bit to the overall phenotype. And it's gonna be the, the sort of additive addition of all of them that gives you your overall phenotype. And when this happens, we usually see this bell-shaped distribution of phenotypes. And this is um, because we have a range of phenotypes. Um, so when we we're thinking about flower color, we had, depending on the kind of dominance, maybe only two options. You're either red or white, or it could be red or pink or white. Um, but there were only a, a small number of options that you could sort of like put into different buckets. But for these... Um, polygenic inheritance situations, the trait is going to exist on a continuum um, where we're going to say it's a quantitative trait, where it's existing on a continuum, as opposed to a discrete trait where you're just going to have different categories. Um, so examples of this are skin color, um, which is, is determined by a number of genes, uh, depending on who you ask at least four, but some people think there are dozens. Um, so this is a simplified example where they're only showing three genes that could contribute to skin color, but depending on whether all of those genes are encoding for pigment, in which case you'll get darker skin color, or whether those genes are not coding for very much pigment, in which case you'll get a lighter, lighter skin color, but then there are a lot of options in between as well. And you can think the same thing about height, right? There's a lot of, there's a huge range of heights in the, in the human population, and they exist on a continuum on this kind of bell-shaped curve. And then the final uh, sort of extension to, to, to Mendelian inheritance that we'll talk about is the effect that the environment can have on a given phenotype. So you could have um, many situations where organisms could have the exact same genotype, 
but what they look like is going to it's going to be dependent on the environment that they're raised in or the environment that they're living in. Um, so one example is this uh, Himalayan rabbit, and their fur color pattern is going to be um, influenced by the temperature that they're raised in. So you can see that the rabbits that are raised in colder temperatures have these black um, ears and feet and nose, whereas the rabbits that are raised in warmer temperatures are completely white. Um, and this darker coloration on at the extremities help um, help prevent heat loss in the, in the rabbits. So if they're colder, they have these darker areas to, to prevent um, too much heat from escaping them. Another example is uh, hydrangeas, and these are, uh, you could have the exact same hydrangea plant and the color of the flowers is going to depend on the pH of the soil that it's being planted in. So a more acidic pH of the soil is going to produce more blue colored flowers and a more basic uh, or alkaline pH is going to produce more red colored flowers. So you can um, change the color of your hydrangea by altering the pH of the soil that it's in. And then finally, um, we have these salamanders from Hokkaido, and their, in, their morphology or their appearance is dependent on whether they have a lot of large prey in the water that they're living in. So here's sort of the basic form of the salamander, but if they're raised with a lot of large prey, they get this really big head with a larger mouth that enables them to um, better eat the prey. And they actually also have a defensive morph that occurs when they're raised with predators, where they get an extra large uh, tail that helps them swim away faster. So the environment can affect um, what the the what kind of phenotype you get from a given um, allele combination. Okay, so that's it for our discussion on these more complex patterns of inheritance, and I'll see you all later.